Our Lord, we, we quiet our souls and we praise you. And we recognize that for those of us who have received this free gift of salvation, we can sing this song with great certainty, not because of anything that we have done, but because of everything that Jesus Christ has done for us. Lord, we, we come to you now as we prepare to continue worshiping by studying your word. And, and I, I pray for all of us here today, Father, people come with different things they're concerned about, different burdens, different anxieties and stresses, different things going on in work and the home and in their personal life. And Father, I pray first for those who may be here today that are not sure where they stand with you. Lord, I ask and pray that your Holy Spirit would take your word and as only you can, that today might be the day of salvation, that they would leave here changed. And Father, for those who came with weary or broken hearts, I pray your Holy Spirit would just minister healing and that we would see, Lord Jesus, that you and your grace, you're the answer to all that we long for and all that we need. And Father, for those of us who are just here and we're, we're, we're hungry, I pray, Father, that you would help us to leave here just feasting on the incredible truths that we get to study in Scripture today. That your grace is so far beyond our ability to understand. It's so amazing and you offer it so freely. And I pray we'd leave here today rejoicing. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. It is nice to see you today. Um, just a quick word. So when we do have every now and then words in us, how many of you speak a little Spanish? Let me just ask that. A little. A little. A lot. All right. A little or a lot. And how many of you speak zero? None. Okay. Let me tell you something. When we sing, you can... You're gonna, you will learn through singing so you can, and particularly when it's a familiar song like Amazing Grace, so I encourage you, don't be embarrassed, just give it a try, okay? I had a friend when I was in seminary in Southwestern back in the day from Puerto Rico, and his name was Victor Martinez, and uh, he was a great guy, just big old bear of a guy. He played for Puerto Rico's uh, um, uh, under 17, I think it was. Uh, basketball team and travel the world. Just a big guy. But he used to tell me, hermano, español es la lengua de cielo. And I'm saying that incorrectly, but he was, he was, what he was saying was, brother, Spanish is the language of heaven. And when we get there, we're all speaking Spanish. So you might want to learn it now. <laughs> but we would pray together all the time. And I learned, you will learn more Spanish as you just practice and get to talk to people than you ever will by trying to study in a in a book. So uh, enjoy that, please. And I just praise God for what he's doing in our Spanish-speaking ministry. Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. We are in our sermon series in the book of Romans. We're walking verse by verse. And the title of the sermon series is Why the Gospel is Good News. Why the Gospel is Good News. The title of the sermon today is abundant, amazing grace with an exclamation mark. You remember last week, we, we, we looked at some pretty rough news. It was hard, tough news. But we get to shift today to beautiful news. I, I'm going to start off by just telling you, if you take notes, on the front end and in the middle, there will be several cross-references that will come rather quickly, so I encourage you to write them down. And I will also say that we're going to start off the message with the longest illustration that I've ever used to start an, uh, a sermon, but I, I think it's so appropriate and the story is so powerful that it just sets the stage for where we're going. Author Timothy Paul Jones, or Dr. Timothy Paul Jones, who was or is a professor at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, wrote a book... And you know he's a professor with the title of a book this long. Finding Freedom Through the Intoxicating Joy of Irresistible Grace. That's a long title. But it's a really neat book. And he tells this story. He writes, I never dreamed that taking a child to Disney World could be so difficult. Or that such a trip could make me, uh, teach me so much about God's outrageous grace. 
our middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family. I am sure this couple had the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. After a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption, and we ended up welcoming an eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them but left their adopted daughter with a family friend. Usually, at least in this child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on the trip. And so by the time we adopted our daughter, he writes, she had seen many pictures of Disney World and she had heard about the rides and the characters and the parades. But when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she had always been the one left outside. Once I found out about this history, I made plans to take her to Disney World. The next time a speaking engagement took our family to the southeastern United States. What I didn't expect he says, was that the prospect of visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in our newest daughter. In the month leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been much easier just to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister as deeply as possible. And as the days on the calendar moved closer and closer to the trip, her mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, I pulled our daughter into my lap to talk through the latest escapade. I know what you're going to do, she said flatly. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, he writes. But her downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way to the Magic Kingdom. She would tried and failed that test many times. So she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on earth. And I will just say, side note, there are probably someone here today, there is probably someone here today, if not some ones, who is doing that exact same thing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus offers you eternal life. He offers you forgiveness, and you can come to him. He goes on to write, in retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that particular moment, I was tempted to turn her fear to my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right. We won't take you. But by God's grace, I did not do that. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded. Her brown eyes were filled with tears. Yes. He said, are you a part of this family? She nodded again. Well, then you're going with us. I'm sure there are going to be consequences to help you remember what's right and wrong. But you're part of this family, and we're not leaving you behind. He goes on to write, I'd like to say that her behavior now grew better after that moment. <laughs> it didn't. Her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all along the way to Lake Buena Vista. Still, we headed to Disney World on the day that we had promised, and it was a typical Disney day, overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, lots of lines mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going again someday. In our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, pensive, and weepy at times, but her long month facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, held her, and I asked, so how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled down with her stuffed unicorn. And after a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly. Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. That's the message of outrageous grace. Outrageous grace is not a, fee, uh, a favor that you and I can achieve by being good. It's the gift that we receive by belonging to God. Here are some cross-references. It's Matthew 21 through 16. 
in Matthew 21 through 16. It's the story of a farmer paying a full day's wages to a crew of deadbeat day laborers with only a single hour punched in on their time cards. Or in Ezekiel 16, 8 through verse 63, Ezekiel 16, 8 through 63, or Hosea 1, Verse 1 through 3, 5, it's a man marrying an abandoned woman and then refusing to forsake his covenant with her when she turns out to be a prostitute. Or it's the love of a father who hands over his finest rings and robes to a young man who had squandered his inheritance on drunken binges with fair-weather friends. That's the story of the prodigal son, as you know. In Luke 15, 11 through 32, meaning it's a one-way love that calls you into the kingdom, not because you have been good, but because God has chosen you and made you his own. And now he is chasing you to the ends of the earth to keep you as his child and nothing in heaven or hell will ever stop him. But here's what amazing is what's so amazing about God's outrageous grace. This is not merely what God the Father would do. It's what he did do. God could have chosen to save anyone, everyone, or no one from Adam's fallen race. But what God did was to choose a multi-hued multitude of someones. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, one of those someones was you. God in Christ has declared over you, I could have chosen anyone in this whole world as my child, and I chose you. No matter what you say or do, neither my love nor my choice will ever change. That's grace, and that's amazing. Do you celebrate that if you belong to Christ? Today we are looking at abundant, amazing grace that is freely offered to all, anyone who will repent of their sin and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be good to earn it. In fact, you can't earn it. You can't receive it because it, you can only receive it rather because it's a gift. So in Romans, we are in Romans 5. We'll do a quick review. Last week, we looked at Romans 5, 12 through 14, and we saw some significant truths. And again, these were bad news truths, but we had to look at them so that we can really appreciate the good news. First, we saw that sin entered the world through one man, Adam. Second, we saw that death entered the world through sin. And third, we saw that death spread to all humans because all sinned. Paul clearly articulated in that passage last week what we would call the doctrine of original sin. And we saw that we all sinned when Adam sinned. I'll quote MacArthur, who stated it well, because all humanity existed in the loins of Adam and have through procreation inherited his fallenness and depravity, it can be said that all sinned in him. Therefore, humans are not sinners because they sin, rather they sin because they're sinners. And we also saw last week the principle of representation. We looked at two historical figures, Adam and Jesus Christ, both are representatives. You're either in Adam Everyone here is in one of these places, meaning you're represented by Adam, meaning you're still lost and dead in your sins and separated from God, or you are in Christ. You're represented by Christ. You've been born again. You've been reconciled to the Father. Your sins have been forgiven. That's a quick review, so let's get to our text today. We will read the text in its entirety, then we'll circle back and break it down into verse by verse. Romans 5, 15 through 17. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass bought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought condemnation justification. And again, and we justify, to be justified, uh, justification is a significant word in the book of Romans. Paul uses it a lot. And remember, it's a legal term, meaning to be pronounced not guilty, that you are righteous with God, not because of what you have done, but because he has justified you if you've placed your faith and trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ. We're clear on that, right? For if, verse 17, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, 
Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. We said this last week. Once we get uh, verses 1 through 11 in Romans 5, it was very straightforward. We could look at that and we understood that. We're looking at all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus because we Christians have been justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We looked at the blessings, but then when we get to verse 12 and following, this is one of those times when you're reading the Bible where you're like, I don't, I mean, Paul seems to be repeating. I, I'm not sure. I'll just skip. And what did we say last week? When you get to a part of Scripture like this, don't skip. That's where you need to stop, plant, study, and say, what, what, what is God saying here? Okay? So that's why we're going to camp out here. It would have been so easy for me last week to just say, you know, I'm going to combine these complex passages and just do a 30,000-foot view and send you on your way but that would dishonor you and dishonor God above all and his word. We need to understand what's being said, okay? So the first thing I want you to notice is this. There is an emphasis on the word grace or the words the gift in verses 15 through 17. There's this emphasis on grace or the gift eight times. So do you think that Paul really wants us to understand something here? Or God is telling Paul, make sure they understand this. Paul is driving home a remarkable reality for the Christian. By grace, we have a new identity, a new future, a new peace, and the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. So let's break this down verse by verse. 15, the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift. Say free gift. Free gift. By the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ abounded for many. Meaning, Adam's sin impacted all of humanity. Paul has already addressed that in verse 12, which we have looked at quite extensively last week. So when Paul says many in verse 15, we have to look at the context of chapter 5, and we understand that many means everyone everybody, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, and what we saw last week was that because of that one man's sin, all of us are born into sin. All of us have a sinful nature, and all of us, we know from Romans 3, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that if many died, he's using that word with two distinct meanings in verse 15. He will do the exact same thing in verse 18. So please note that when we get to verse 18 next week. But the many here, for if many died through one man's trespass, that's referring to all of us. Paul has already established that all men without exception are guilty of sin and subject to death. The many who die refer to those who were Adam's descendants, those who are represented by Adam, those who remain in Adam, those who have not repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus Christ. Conversely, much more... Is Jesus Christ's one act of redemption, which leads to eternal life for all who repent and believe. So what he's saying here is that Jesus' one act was infinitely and immeasurably greater than Adam's one act of rebellion. Jesus' one act of redemption was infinitely and immeasurably greater than Adam's one act of rebellion, which led to condemnation. Tony Merida writes the following in his commentary on Romans. He says, Paul is painting a dark but accurate picture of sin so that the good news of Jesus Christ will shine. It's like what a jeweler may do when putting a diamond on a black cloth so as to draw attention to the sparkle of the diamond. Adam's action was dark. It was negative. It brought spiritual and physical death to everyone. Jesus' action, however, was pure. It was positive. The gracious work of Jesus Christ overflowed to many. Again, context does not allow the word many in verse 15 to refer to all people when talking about Jesus' act. That would be something that's known as universalism. What does that mean? That's the idea that, well, in the end, everyone will be saved. And there are people who believe that. There are churches built on that. In the end, everybody will be saved. You need to understand that there are many biblical problems with that. First of all, we don't see that anywhere in Scripture. That's, that's a big problem. But second of all, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did of heaven. And Jesus made it very clear that that there were two paths that people could be on in life. 
There was this narrow road that led to life. And that road is it actually is Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. And there's a broad, super highway that leads to death. And most of humanity is on it, leading towards destruction. So the idea that, well, in the end, everybody will be saved because you know, Jesus died on the cross, and so you don't have to really respond. No, you must respond. Over and over and over in Scripture, that's the pattern that we see. The invitation is given. Who will come? Who will follow Jesus? You need to understand that salvation is offered to all, but people must receive the gift. Just knowing about it won't save you. Just saying, well, yeah, I get all that. I believe in God. I know about the way you're talking about the gospel. I'm good. No, you must personally receive and respond. Have you done that? If it is not received, there's no forgiveness. There's no reconciliation to God. There's no eternal life. There's no life with God now. And we get to verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. The free gift refers to salvation by grace alone. Again, God graciously offering salvation as a gift. Again, you can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't clean yourself up for it. The idea is nowhere in Scripture where you need to hurry up and get your life together, and then you're good enough, and Jesus will give you the gift. No. You come to him just as you are, and all your sin, shame, and guilt, your brokenness, and he will clean you up. free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. That one man is Adam, who represented all of humanity in the garden. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So here's the contrast. Adam's action brings sin, death, and condemnation to all of us. And now all of us, because of that one man's act, are guilty before God because we are sinners and we continue to sin and we're sinful by nature. By one sin, Adam condemned himself and all of us. However, oh, oh, what a wonderful however. The free gift of salvation offered through Jesus Christ following many trespasses brought justification. The free gift of salvation of Jesus Christ washes away all of our sin, every single sin. And this free gift of salvation changes your nature. We go from being sinners by nature to being new creations in Christ. Write down 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. What the Lord does when you come to saving faith. Therefore, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. One sin plunged everyone into sin, death, and condemnation, but one amazing free gift brings forgiveness for every single sin that's ever been committed for all who will receive that gift. That gift not only covers our sin, shame, and guilt, it changes our nature. It makes us a brand new creation. We are now sons and daughters of the living God adopted into his family. Adam's work results in condemnation. Jesus' work results in justification. So again, you have one of two statuses. You're either in Adam and therefore under condemnation, or you are in Christ and you've been justified freely by his grace. There's another theme that we see here repeated in Romans, a theme that concerns our identity or our status. You see, in the gospel, we get a new identity. Born again believers are not in Adam any longer. We are now in Christ. That's a profound change of identity, of status, of location. The grace of God moves us from a swamp to a palace, from quicksand to standing on the rock. And we don't deserve any of that. None of it. And this new identity also has really important implications for us. Our identity in Jesus Christ should impact everything about us. Let me give you some practical application points for how your identity in Christ should change you and change me. Because if you're in Christ, now we no longer build our lives on things like performance, our popularity, power, our bank account toys we have, 
what others think of us. No, we are justified by God. We're reconciled to God. We're adopted by God. Going back to Romans 1, 7, we are now loved by God. That is our new identity, and we live out of that reality. We live for an audience of one. So if you are renewing your mind on these gospel truths, and I encourage you to preach the gospel to yourself daily. If you're renewing your mind on these gospel truths and if you're seeking to walk with Jesus in this new identity, then you will grow as a person of humility, gratitude. You'll become more generous, compassionate, loving, holy, meaning you're going to become more like Jesus. Your desires will become more like his desires. You'll become more conformed to the image of Christ. Now, this is a process, of course. None of us can say, oh, yeah, I'm there. I'm fully, I fully arrived. We will not fully arrive on this side of eternity. But if you belong to Jesus Christ, the gospel changes you. In fact, the gospel changes everything. So if we belong to Christ, there should be some fruit in our lives that bears witness that we have a new nature, that we are in Christ, that we have this new identity. Let's look at verse 17. For if by one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Robert Lutham had this to say about verse 17, and I like the imagery he uses because I think it's easy for all of us to grasp. I think we understand this. He says this, Paul's point is that we're not addressed merely as discrete individuals, but instead we're placed in solidaristic groups or teams. Adam was the head or the captain of a team which we were all members. His sin plunged the whole team into sin, ruin, death, and condemnation. What Christ did for us was also done as the head of a team of which Christians are a part. He did it on our behalf. For us, God reckons it to our account as a result of our being united through faith with him as the head of our team. Our justification is therefore grounded on our union with Christ. So I would ask you this, whose team are you on and who is your team captain? Because you have one. It's either Adam or it's the Lord Jesus Christ. For if by one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Do you notice how Paul refers to grace in verse 17? An abundance of grace. An abundance of grace. An overflow of grace. Which is exactly what we get through Jesus Christ. Not just a, a little grace to cover some of your sin. Not just grace to cover just your past sin, but you, you got to be perfect the rest of the way. No, rather, it is an overflowing, abundant amount of grace that covers all your sin, past, present, and future. It's enough to change your identity, enough to change your nature. It's enough to change you. It's enough to change your present. It's enough to change your eternity. That's an amazing, powerful grace. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you received that gift? And if you have, do you still marvel out of that gift? At that gift? Are you living out of your new identity? Or are you trying to live in two different worlds? You see, Jesus, when he saves us, he calls us into a new life, a life where we walk with him, where we abide with him, where we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, a life where we take his yoke upon ourselves and learn from him, a life where we experience the meaningful an abundant life that he promised us in John 10.10. 10. He doesn't save us just to say, oh, I'm giving to make sure you get to heaven. He's changing everything in the now. A life where we no longer live for ourselves, but for the glory of God and the blessing of others, where we're able to experience an intimate relationship with our heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. Let me ask you how you need to respond today. If you were here and you were unsure of where you stand with Jesus Christ, if you're, un, if you're not clear where you are in terms of, if, have I received this free gift or not, in a moment we're going to stand and, and we're going to sing. I will be here in the front. We'll have a deacon on either side of the aisles. If you, if you feel so led, you can come forward and say, I need to really nail this down. And we will set up a time and let's talk. Let's nail that down. 
or perhaps you're here and you, you believe the Lord is calling you to plant yourself in this church, in covenant community with this church, to be on mission with this church, and you want to you join or learn more about that process, please come forward and say, yeah, we want to plant ourselves here, or I want to plant myself here, and we will set a time to meet. Yet some of you may be here and you've trusted in Christ, but you've not yet followed through in your first act of obedience, which is believer's baptism. Baptism doesn't save you, but it is a really significant matter of obedience. If you need to nail that down, please come forward. We'll, we'll set up a time to talk. If you're watching us by live stream, if you have questions about any of these things, send us an email, please, at info at Stonebridge SA, and we will set a time to meet. Others today, perhaps we just need to stand where we are and just worship the Lord and say, Lord, thank you for such an amazing grace. However you need to respond to the Lord, please do so as he leads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this amazing grace that you have lavished upon us through Jesus Christ. It's not just a little grace, Lord. It is an abundant, overflowing grace. And Lord, just like that kid in the story, we don't deserve that. And yet, you pour it out and you offer it freely. And Father, I pray that we would respond to that gift, respond to you. And Father, I pray that if we've already received that gift, that we would live out of this new identity. And Lord, that we would declare how glorious and wonderful you are so that all would know that you and you alone are our hope, Jesus. Help us to respond as we need to today. In Jesus' name, amen.